Good afternoon. Thanks for showing up. My name is Tom Bell. As you can see from the title here, today I'm going to talk about white flag, black flag, and in between. I suppose that's cryptic. I mean for it to be cryptic. And the idea is, hopefully, I'll explain it to you as we go along. I'm going to start out with a story, um, a true story, about an incident in American history that very few people are aware of, but I've been researching lately. It's a very interesting example of how even when well-meaning state action can inflict terrible costs on innocents. These are the Aleutian Islands. You'll note specifically it's uh, the Aleutian Islands as of August 1st, 1942. Around that time, the Japanese had begun invading the Aleutian Islands. This, of course, was World War II. Japan is somewhere off to the southwest of the Aleutian Islands. They're very isolated, one of the most isolated territories of the United States. And at that time, it was just a territory of the United States, not yet a state. But make no mistake about it, the people living there had all the full protections of any U.S. citizen. That had been established in U.S. law well before the incidents that I'm going to tell you about. The Japanese were approaching from the southwest, and they began to invade these islands. Atu Island in particular, they seized and occupied. And they found there some natives, as well as some Caucasians. And they took them with them back to Japan. Now those natives, I'm not going to say much about, except I will say, they fared even worse than the people I'm going to tell you about. So keep in mind, this is not an apology for the United States and what it did to the Aleutian natives, but it does bear noting that worse things happened at the hands of other statists. So the Japanese started invading, and how did the Americans react? They saw that this was a threat, not just to the military prospects for the United States. <coughs> they were not happy about the Japanese establishing these land holds on their territory, but also they had in mind the well-being of the natives who were scattered in these small settlements throughout the islands. So what did U.S. officials do? Of course, the first thing they did was they started trying to push out the Japanese. This is a propaganda poster from that era. I suppose they distributed these posters throughout the United States to stir up the civilians and to describe their worthwhile goals. It was to drive the Japanese who had established a foothold. As far as I know, this is the only foothold they established this close to the United States. Had established a foothold in the United States. And they were <coughs> saying, let's rally the troops and drive out the Japs. And that's what they did. They rounded up a a fair-sized flotilla and invaded the Aleutian Islands. I guess we can say invade. It was already United States territory, but it was very thinly populated, and it was even less populated by the time they were done. Because what did they do? They evacuated the Aleutians. The Aleutian natives who were scattered throughout small settlements throughout the islands, this is one of the more primitive settlements. It's an interesting example. You can see here they have fish hanging out to dry. There's one of the natives there. He's wearing Western garb. They were quasi-Westernized. They actually had had a lot of contact with the Russians. And they were almost to a one members of the Orthodox Church. It's quite interesting. Back here, though, you can see a framed house. And the houses of the larger settlements were a little more sophisticated than what you see here. This is a little more typical. This is the village of St. Paul. It was one of the villages evacuated by the Americans. Now this so far sounds at least uh, not horrible. And let us concede, it was not the sort of internment suffered by the Japanese on the west coast. This is an example of where the Japanese ended up. Some of them in one of these internment camps, as some of you probably, probably all of you know, the Japanese internment camps are settled throughout the West and the Midwest here in Arkansas. And the motives behind that internment were rather more base than the motives behind the internment and evacuation of the Aleutians. No one accused the Aleutians of being spies. It was not racial animosity against the Aleutians. They were basically unknown to Americans. And of course, they were not the same, uh, they didn't have the same ancestry as the invaders. So there was no animosity. But still, they did evacuate the Aleutians, and they fared very badly. Now, I'm showing you pictures from the Japanese internment because we don't have a lot of pictures of what happened to the Aleutians, so I'll just tell you what happened to the Aleutians. 
You can see this young lady doesn't look very happy, and that indeed was, I'm sure, how many of the illusions felt about their evacuation and internment. It was not well organized. They gathered up these native people, and they put them in holds of ships, and they sent them to settlements on the mainland in Alaska. There was a totally different environment from the one that they were used to. It was, for example, if you go back, you can see the Aleutian territory was treeless, rather sparse. It was a hard place to live. Although it wasn't Alaska, it wasn't freezing cold. It was basically foggy all the time, rather like this and probably 40 degrees cooler most of the while. And they fished, and they trapped, and they got by, but they were hardly thriving. They were not at all used to the places they got sent. And even if they had been used to these much colder, forested, mountainous regions, they would not have fared well. They put them in abandoned canneries and stuffed them in there. No, they were not imprisoned. They were free to go. They didn't really have anywhere to go. Most of them ended up unemployed. The surrounding areas, there were often settlements near these abandoned canneries where they stuffed the illusions, but they didn't want anything to do with the illusions. They saw them as stealing their jobs. They didn't view them as invaders, but they were alien. And the illusions did not fare well at all. They were in very unhealthy conditions. Many of their elders died from the hardships of the journey, and their youngest, most vulnerable uh, uh, members of their community as well. It was tragic for their community in terms of their culture because the elders alone basically knew how to build their traditional crafts, their skin hide boats, for example, and how to hunt seals. And the sort of the, 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 the folks who survived didn't have all that knowledge. They had relied on their elders, many of whom died in this evacuation. And the younger generation, many of them died because of the hardships of what they went through. Also what happened was when they evacuated these towns, they brought in military forces, United States military forces. In a few cases, they completely leveled the towns. They were worried about the Japanese invading, so they had a sort of burnt earth policy in many of the islands they evacuated. They came in, they told the natives, you have to leave, you're coming with us. And then they just got rid of all the structures, privately owned houses. In other places, they left the buildings, but what happened? Well, they brought in all these US troops, young men, armed to the tooth, far from home, restless, bored, because basically the Japanese never showed up again. There was some fighting. It was quite bloody in one of the, or two of the farthest islands. But for the most part, they showed up, waited for things to happen, looked at the fog, and then started ransacking these homes and churches. And when the Aleutians were brought back, about a year later, those who survived, they found these homes vacant, all their personal property destroyed, Oftentimes, their real property, their buildings, completely burnt or effectively totally unusable. And they were um, quite unhappy by this experience. Now, I've been researching this for reasons that don't really have a whole lot to do with my talk today. It's quite happenstance. I've been lately researching and writing about, believe it or not, the Third Amendment of the US Constitution. <laughs> and you know what that's about, the Third Amendment? Very few people know what the Third Amendment is about. I'm just going to read it to you now because it's my favorite amendment of the U.S. Constitution. It's barely used ever, so no one's occupying any houses. Very good. Excellent. Excellent. You're doing better than almost anyone in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> I have here my copy of the Pocket Constitution, the Cato Pocket Constitution. I can highly recommend it to you. I carry it with me all, all the time, especially when I'm going through security. And uh, I'll just read the Third Amendment to you, just because it doesn't have a lot to do with my talk, but it's kind of fun to notice. No soldier shall, in time of peace, be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, which it was in 1942, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. Now, the reason I got interested in this because it was because there was quite evidently instances, there were instances of quartering during this evacuation and internment of the illusions. Not a lot of it. But there were a few cases where uh, uh, U.S. officials and soldiers were put in the natives' homes, which were vacant. That was not the worst thing the illusion suffered. Let's be clear about that. But it was not done in a manner prescribed by law, as the Third Amendment requires. Congress, this, all this happened completely under the radar as far as Congress was concerned. It doesn't even seem to, as if executive officials in Washington, D.C. had much of a hand in what was going on on the other side of the globe. Basically, they left it to military officials, and they botched it. They really <coughs> messed it up, and they hurt the illusions. And that's how I got interested in this. But then it occurred to me, for purposes of this talk, I realized, you know, this is a paradigmatic case of how states treat their citizens. This is not 
Now, I know you might disagree with me on this, and that's fine. I know there are ardent anti-statists who think that everyone who has a bad is out to get you. And I don't dispute there are many bad people in government, just like there are bad people everywhere. But I've hung around a lot of civil servants, and indeed there were those in my family. My father worked for the agriculture department. My mother worked for the local public school. She was a librarian. And so I've rubbed shoulders with a lot of these people who are for government, and they're not any more wicked than the rest of us, which isn't saying much perhaps, but they're not especially wicked, and they're not out to get us, but they don't necessarily have our best interests in mind. And that was the case with the illusions. They weren't out to get them. They were actually trying to save them. They're on the same team. They don't really care much about the illusion's rights. They didn't even read the Constitution and happen to think, oh my gosh, look at this, we're not allowed to do this. They did, they didn't care. And yet, look where it left the illusions. Their culture was flattened. Many of their people effectively killed. They certainly died. Whether or not we say the US officials killed them, we can debate. But their deaths happened because of this evacuation and internment. And I think that's sort of a paradigmatic example, certainly more stark, well, most of us suffer, but it's a paradigmatic example of how state action works. It's not that they're out to get us so much as they have other goals in mind and we're in the way. Think of another example. Ms. Kilo, who had her house taken in Connecticut. You've heard of the Kilo case. Were they out to get Ms. Kilo? Did they dislike her? Did they think she was the wrong you know, ethnic background? No. She just had a house they wanted. Sorry, lady. Nothing personal. We want your house. Scram. <laughs> So that's sort of what happened with the illusion. Nothing personal, natives, but you're kind of in the way. We don't want you to get shot by the Japanese. It would look, they actually have, there was a big, there, I should tell you this, you know, so you're not feeling too bad about why, you should still feel terrible about this, but about four decades later, it only took them more than 40 years, they finally did an official investigation into all of this. It was actually triggered mostly by the Japanese internment, but when they were researching that, they discovered, oh, these other people were affected too. They did a big study, wrote a whole book, the commission, the Congressional Commission wrote a book called Personal Justice Denied, and reparations were paid to the tune of $12,000 maximum per person among the illusions to those who suffered these wrongs. Of course, many were dead by that time. We can dispute whether or not that was the proper amount, but certainly waiting four plus decades to offer restitution was a bit, uh, yeah, it's a bit questionable. So there you go. I wanted to tell. I wanted to tell you this story. It's an interesting bit of American history, and I think again it is a paradigmatic example of what happens when we individual citizens come into contact with government agents. It's not so often, not always at least, that they're out to get us. It's just sort of we're in the way. They don't care, and they're just going to use their force as they can, and that's unfortunate. And this talk is about what we do about that. And this is one thing you can do. This is the white flag. You just give up. You lay back and you let them have their way and hope they go away as soon as they see fit. This is the white flag. And I got to admit, for most people, most of the time, this is basically what they do. Oh, well, you know, they'll go vote once in a while and certainly they'll bitch and moan to their friends. Can you believe the taxes? And the more activists among them, and probably you're among those, more likely, you, uh, you know, you fight it and all. But for most people, most of the time, it's sort of, this is an okay place to live. They've not lately killed the kulaks. <laughs> I still mostly own my house and stuff. So I'm going to put up with it. Not a really palatable solution, but it is an approach to the problem of having your rights violated. On the other side, here's the black flag. You can sort of declare yourself an enemy of organized society if it deserves that name. Fly the pirate flag and strike out on your own and organize affairs with your fellow travelers and suffer the consequences, but do it bravely and with a knife clutch between your teeth. <laughs> now, I don't want to demean at all what the pirates accomplished. Has anybody read Peter Leeson's wonderful book, The Invisible Hook? Oh, it's a wonderful book. Peter Leeson, L-E-E-S, is it Owen? Owen. Owen. He's an economist at GMU, wrote a wonderful book called The Invisible Hook, and it's all about explaining pirate society in terms of economics. And he goes into some detail about how the pirates organized their little societies, because they were little societies. They were not a bunch of chaotic, insane berserkers. They were, surprise, surprise, rational utility maximizers. They were actually ahead of 
the, the founders of the United States in forming constitutions. They had little constitutions for their own little ships so they could regulate their affairs. They had very detailed rules about how to divvy up the treasure, about who was in charge. For example, you might think, well, the captain was in charge. And to be sure, the captain had a lot of say in what happened, in what happened on these ships. But the quartermaster was kind of like the body of government. The quartermaster was a very important person on the ship whose power kind of balanced that of the captains. The captain was like the executive, and he was in charge when they went into battle. It was a captain who had all the say when it was a question of whether you tack into the wind or whether you flee from the merchant uh, uh, ship. Or, you know, that was the captain's call. It was a quartermaster who decided how to divvy up the loot. Also, the quartermaster then had a lot of power. So I, I, I just recommend you look at this book. This is an alternative. This is an alternative when faced with unjust actions of state officials. It's basically you say, I'm done with this. I'm striking out on my own. They're not going to like this. They're going to come after me. With uh, cannons, or these days more advanced technologies, and we're just going to fight it out. And well, we know where that left the pirates. <laughs> it took a while. They put up a good fight. We got some great stories out of it, and at least that one good book. But it didn't work out well for the pirates. They were outnumbered and outgunned. So maybe there's a happy medium. Maybe, maybe not. So you ask, well, what is between the white flag giving up and the black flag sort of going mano a mano with the statists? Well, it looks great. And that's not very inspiring. <laughs> not sure anyone's going to march to battle under that. But um, I'm actually aiming at something else here. I would argue, you know, yes, there is something in between. It's gray at low resolution. But if you sharpen this up, here, I think, is this intermediary position you can end at. So basically, it's the same thing. I just played around in, you know, um, what was it, Adobe something. And basically, it's the same document, tighten it up. I just found this on the internet. What is it? It's a management agreement. I found a whole website full of all different kinds of contracts. And I decided, well, what I want to talk about are contracts for governing services. Contracts for governing services. I saw that uh, Spencer McCallum was here. I've never met him. He inspired some of my research years ago. And he wrote uh, some wonderful things about basically how now apartment buildings and hotels are basically governments of a sort with which you enter into a contract, which is expressly written out. I haven't actually signed in at the hotel. I mean, my wife drove me up, and I jumped out and ran here because I was worried I'd be late. But I assume we're going to sign in at some point. There goes some paperwork, and we'll sign it. And it'll have provisions read right like these. This is some kind of management agreement between a couple of businesses. But it's a service contract. And that's how I'm always trying to get people to think about governments, is it's just a service industry. It happens to be a service industry where there's a monopoly claim by one of the providers. It's as if at the airport, if you flew in, it's just Avis, nobody else. It's a service contract you enter into. You're probably not going to get very good treatment if Avis is the only car rental company, especially if they have a bunch of guns. <laughs> And that's basically the way it works now. But I think that if we think about government as a service industry, we can start thinking about having competing providers of this very important service. As you all know, anarchists are not people who are especially fond of chaos. Well, maybe some are. They come in all stripes. I, kind of, I tend to stay away from the A word because people get confused. They think anarchy means chaos. And in one version of it, it does. Although if you go back to the Greek roots of the word, it means without a crown, basically, without a ruler, which doesn't, of course, mean chaos. But if you think of governments as service providers, it makes you look at the Constitution in a new light. I mean, one way to look at this is, again, here's my pocket Constitution, which I carry around. And I have to admit I'm rather fond of the Constitution, despite its somewhat salient flaws, because there's some great stuff in here. If you sit down and read it, it's really not a bad agreement. Now, it's imperfectly formed and interpreted. It's imperfectly formed because when you sign a contract with the hotel, you expressly consent to it. And you can look, because I have, I can tell you, and you will not find anywhere in here a place to sign on the dotted line. <laughs> Which, of course, uh, Lysander Spooner made note of. Lysander Spooner, in his wonderful work, No Treason, uh, basically said, this is interesting, but no, no one asked me what I thought. And I never agreed to it, so I'm not bound. Now, I happen to have a, a 
different and uh, more graduated view of how you can set the things, which I won't get into here. But I will say, conceitedly, this compact, this supposed contract for governing services, is very perfectly formed. We have only very weak signals that people have consented to this. What do we have? I mean, we have left, basically, yeah. for most people. Now, I won't say that. I think it does bear noting there are people who have expressly consented to this. Who would those be? That's right, government officials. If you look at this very carefully, the founders were, took care of this. You, you know, it's in different parts, but every one of the members of the three branches, judicial, executive, religious branches, have to take oaths to uphold and affirm this constitution. It's a little sad when you realize they don't even know what's in there. Look at the illusions. The illusions, very plain. They had troops quartered on them, although, again, that wasn't the worst thing they suffered. But here's the thing that really gets me. And this is setting aside all the personal wrongs that they suffered. My paper, if you want to look it up, it's uh, just go to TomMibbyBell.com. It's uh, the thing I wrote most recently on um, the Third Amendment. But it's also about the takings clause. So, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Think about all the private property of the illusions they destroyed. Remember, again, they were natives in a U.S. territory, but it was well established, even before World War II, they had the full protection of the Constitution, including the takings clause of the Fifth Amendment. It didn't come up for 40 years. For 40 years plus, no one even thought, boom, oh, we destroyed all their personal property. That's a problem. We should offer them recompense. Four decades passed before this even became an issue, and yet all that time, this plain text was right under the noses not only of the government officials, but of the illusions. Apparently, even the illusions themselves did not think to pick this document up and read it and say, you know, this defines our rights. Let's see what's in here. Like I said, they didn't have attorneys? I don't know. I don't know what happened there. They were not mainstream Americans, let's concede. They weren't living in subdivisions. They were out fishing, very far from even telegraph lines, I suppose, and radio contract, but contact. But still, so this is a very imperfectly formed and interpreted document. So what I'm going to suggest here is, ideally, we would have contracts for governing services that would be just like our contracts with hotels or apes. It's just another, another service industry. We have lots of competition. It's put down in black and white in front of us. We sign on the dotted line, or we don't. Or maybe we dicker for different terms. We say, well, this is very interesting that you have this uh, police power, but I don't see anything here about search and seizure. Let's talk about that. I want to amend this. This is my attorney. We'll be working this through with you. <laughs> Wouldn't it be delightful if we could do that? That's the ideal situation. We're not there yet. Not by a long stretch. In the meantime, we have this, at least in the United States. And in other countries, they often have written constitutions. And I want to suggest to you a way that we could approach the Constitution that would both defend our rights under this current regime better than present interpretations and also take us closer to that better world we can all foresee. We're entering into a government's contract. It's just like signing in at a hotel or going to Hertz rent a car. So here's an old chart. We all know about the old chart, don't we? All right, let me explain this to you guys. I'm going to show you sort of my version of the old chart for constitutional interpretation. So, so we have in place of, on that side, Economic rights, we have response, excuse me, social liberties. In, in place of social liberties there, I have responsiveness. That means responsiveness to the text. We care here about whether or not the text <coughs> means something to people now living. When you read cruel and unusual punishment in this Constitution, does that mean you can publicly lash criminals or brand them? Well, back in the founding era, that was okay. Those were punishments that were practiced. They might have been cruel, but they weren't cruel and unusual, at least. Today, we would think cruel and unusual would be something different. So we want an interpretation of the Constitution which is responsive to the way people now read it. And on the other side, in place of economic rights, we have textual fidelity. You don't want to pick up the Constitution, my most recent paper talks about this, and see private property is protected, and then say, well, but we're going to protect real estate more than personal property. Personal property is movable property jacket, a computer, a car. In the case of the illusions, their religious icons were destroyed, their native handicrafts, things were stolen like big cast iron stones. That's all personal property, it's movable property. If it says private property, darn it, it should mean private property. It doesn't mean real estate mostly and then this other stuff, maybe. It's the plain language. 
That's textual fidelity. So here's what I want to suggest. Here's what we see now. Just like with the Nolan chart, this is so frustrating to those of us who have libertarian views. The media only talk about these two things time and time again. It's so frustrating. And they'll classify libertarians typically as right wingers, except when it's clear that they're not right wingers. And then they'll say, well, they're sort of, you know, in the middle. No, they're not in the middle, they're above. Better, actually, is the way we like to think about it. But, you know, it's orthogonal to the traditional. Facts. And the same thing happens in my field, friends, in constitutional interpretation. You've got the living constitutionalists who basically say, oh, we have to empower courts to interpret the Constitution <laughs> flexibly. Well, that's good in a way. It means when they be cruel and unusual, they lift up their heads from their law books and they look around and they go, oh my gosh, we don't brand people anymore. That's not appropriate. That's good. I want my judges and justices to do that. But the living constitutionalists don't give a toot about what's really written in the text. It's all sort of how it hits them in the gut. Whereas the originalists over here, they're analogous to the right-wingers. And by the way, usually the political fallouts is on the same lines. The originalists are right-wingers and vice versa. And the living constitutionalists are typically left-wingers. Now, these days, I'm trying to change this, but these days, most of my libertarian friends are originalists. And my view of that is because they don't know any better. And my job is to show them there's a better way. What's the better way? It's what I call a consensualist approach to the Constitution, under which we are responsive to the current meaning of the words, and we're also faithful to the text. It's really quite simple. Simply read the Constitution as if it were a contract offered to you by the government. So the government comes up to you and says, hey, we got a nice set of governing services here, a little expensive, but top of the line for you, my friend. Here's our Constitution, what do you think? And you sit down, you read this, and you decide. Hmm, I like this bit about search and seizure, although reasonable sounds a little squishy. Oh, good protections for private property, assuming you take that seriously. Oh, what's this Ninth Amendment? I like that. <laughs> <laughs> so I have all these rights not listed here? Great. <laughs> so, so you would simply read it as you would a contract, essentially. Now, if we did this with the current Constitution, I think we would have such a more liberty-loving uh, world than we have now. And I taught contract law for 10 years. And that's what you took with me, Mr. McPherson? Yes. Mr. McPherson is uh, one of my former students. And uh, he took, I, I now teach, by the way, property. I taught torts, and then I teach, I'm teaching all the common law courses. I'm now around all three. So, but suppose, hopefully you remember this, suppose you sat down and you read the Constitution as if it were a contract. You might be thinking, I don't know. I'm not sure that would work for me. Would that give me what I want? Well, check it out. These are standard principles of contract law, just applied to the Constitution. You would adopt the plain, present, public meaning of the words of the Constitution, just like they would with Avis. If Avis presents you a contract and you have a dispute with Avis, you adopt the plain, present, public meaning of the words. Maybe there's a word in there, vehicle. Avis can't say, Oh, that means a horse-drawn carriage. <laughs> Who just thinks that? So that's good. And believe me, if you sit down and read the Constitution, there's stuff in there that just jumps out. Like these protections of private property. Look at that. If, suppose you've got somebody from Turkmenistan who doesn't know anything about America, and you give them the Constitution, they would think it's a libertarian utopia if they just read the words. We took the words seriously. This is another principle of contract law. There's a non-waivable, meaning you can't get rid of this. You cannot contract around this. You can't have somebody sign a waiver that says, you get to stab me in the back. No, unenforceable if you do that. Non-waivable default rule of good faith and fair dealing. And basically it means you don't stab each other in the back when you're in a contract. Objective meaning counts. It's not the secret intentions that somebody has in their thought bubble. That doesn't matter. Maybe the founders put in reasonable thinking, well, reasonable to us. That doesn't matter. We care about what an objective person presented with these words would take them to mean. The plain meaning trumps the language. So suppose you're talking about reasonable search and seizure. And there's a long line of precedents that say it's OK to, as they just decided in California, it's OK in a traffic stop to take someone's cell phone and go through it. Oh, gee, that's not important to us anymore. Well, who would care about anything in your cell phone? That's only your life. <laughs> it's on your cell phone. And now it's in California, not protected, in a routine traffic stop. Yeah. Well, sorry, you know, reasonable search and seizure provisions are going to trump any of this case law to the contrary. 
Or think of Kilo. Kilo says it's okay to take Miss Kilo's house and give it to this pharmaceutical company, even though it says you can only take private property for public use. That's just not the plain meaning of the text. Say private property for private use. Doesn't matter that they had Kilo on the books. That precedent contradicts the, the plain language. If you have vague terms like reasonable, I already noted reasonable in the Fourth Amendment, the search and seizure protection. It's kind of a squishy word, reasonable. If it is squishy, you lean towards the individual citizen. That's how you do it in contract law. You've got to fight with Hertz or Avis about what reasonable means. It's going to go your way because you're the individual consumer. They're the big corporation. And it's even worse in the case of the government. I mean, it doesn't get bigger and badder than that, right? It's an armed monopoly <laughs> against you, the individual citizen. So we're going to favor your rights in those cases. And this is one of my favorite ones. No one that I know of has brought this up before. I'm really happy about thinking this through, and I think you're going to like this. Suppose you enter into a dispute with Hertz. You sign a contract with Hertz, and you get in a fight with Hertz. They say, you know, you returned the car damaged. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. All right, what are we going to do? What are you going to do? You're going to arbitrate. You're going to arbitrate. There's an arbitration clause in there, I assure you, because they don't want to go to court because it's too slow. Now, suppose this arbitration clause said, in the event of a dispute with Hertz, we're going to go to arbitration. The arbitration panel will be the Hertz CEO, the Hertz COO, and the Hertz CFO. Is there a problem there? <laughs> if Hertz tried to enforce that arbitration clause in a U.S. government court, they'd get nowhere. It would be struck down as void, ad initio, at the start. The U.S. government court would look at this private contract and laugh and say, Hertz, you can't do your customers that way. That's patently wrong and unfair. But if you get in a fight with the government, who's going to settle that? Eventually, yes. But first, you're going to go to a district court. That's an employee of the federal government. Then you go to the Court of Appeals. All getting their W-2s filled out by the federal government. And then finally, the Supreme Court. And they even live in D.C. Right? Is that fair? We wouldn't let Hertz do that. Why do we let the U.S. government do that? Well, I know. You say, well, you know, judicial branch is separated from the other branches. Look, if you've looked at the culture of courts, I mean, judges are smart people, and they mean well, and you're not saying anything against them, especially because they're not but they're, they're even good-looking people. I'll go that far. <laughs> but the point is, it's not fair to let one side of the dispute pick the judges. They cannot be completely disinterested when one person signing the checks. So what should we do? I, say, I think we should do the same thing in constitutional disputes that we do in private disputes. The government gets to pick their judge. I pick my judge. This is how it works with Hertz. This is how it actually works. This is American Arbitration Association rules. And those two, they call them arbitrators, but they're judges effectively, choose a third judge. That gets you a more balanced treatment of the issues. I think we should do that with regard to constitutional law disputes with the government. If I get in a dispute with the government, I say, hey, government, whoa, you're violating my rights. They don't get to pick all the judges. I pick one. I think I'll choose Randy Barnett. I like Randy Barnett. And they choose one. They might pick, I don't know, Judge Elliot Judy. Spitzer. What's it? Who would they choose? Fuck, no. Could be anybody. <laughs> they pick somebody I wouldn't choose. That's the point. And then those two people have to get together and choose a third party. And then that panel of judges settles the dispute. I just want to throw that out there as something I think would be so much better than what we have now. So where does this end up? Well, you know, uh, this is, I got to admit, not a very attractive picture. <laughs> By the way, all the images I got here except for the... Uh, Except for the next one, the last one. All of them are public domain images, which is one reason I use this. But you know, Sea Land, I'm sure you've heard of it. It's this allegedly sovereign territory out in the North uh, Sea. And, and the idea is, you know, at least here, you can choose this sovereign or not. Now, I don't want to live there, even if they have good bandwidth. <laughs> but at least they're going their own way. Um, what we would really like to see is something like this. Uh, one of these uh, seasteading uh, uh, locations, and I'm not demanding here that you know you have a different law here from a different law here from a different law here. Although if you want to set up your floating island like that, I, you know more power to you. Maybe it'd work. I don't know. But the point is you'd have competition, just like we can look out here in the marina and see there's all these individual ships. There'd be all these individual islands. I'm sure you've heard about seasteading. I've actually I've been work, I've worked with uh, Patrick Friedman about this. I'm working on a paper now that's going to talk about um, some of the features. 
If you catch me outside of the room and you have ideas, I'd love to hear from you. Some of the features we want to see in a world where we have competing contracts for governing services. That's the world I foresee. It's just like Hertz or Avis. You go to a different service provider, there's a pretty free exit, there's lots of competition, and I foresee them flying up here. Well, here you can't really tell, but I like to think that maybe here is actually fine print. <laughs> maybe there's writing on that flag. That's probably really like a guy holding a triton with some dolphins swimming around. It's really hard to tell. But I think it'd be cool to have as a flag, or at least think conceptually, that that flag should be a contract. It should be a contract, because that's an inspiring thing. That's what's between the white flag, which is giving up to state power. They're all powerful. Let's stop fighting it and hope it's over with soon so we can get back to our lives. Or the black flag, let's clinch a knife between our teeth and go to war against what? The people who have atomic bombs? It's not going to work out properly. It's just not a fair match. Or this in-between position I'm advocating, which is not that far, frankly, from what we already have if we take this document seriously. I think we should start with this. That will give us a lot of freedom. Start reading this like a contract, and then ultimately get to a world where you can really have contracts that compete with the Constitution. And that will also help those people who want to stay with the U.S. Constitution, just like Hertz has to work harder because they have competition with Avis. So that's what's in between the white flag and black flag. It's basically a black and white flag, one with lots of text in it that you sign on the dotted line or that you don't. It's your choice. And I'll stop with that, and I'll welcome your questions. Thank you. So you have about five minutes to take a question. Sure. Right, so the first question is, would be um, specifically consent. Uh, so if, you're moving, if you plan to move towards a consensual society, and I have no idea how you're actually planning on doing that, uh, but it, would, uh, it seems to imply that the idea that you can ever, ever consent to something that the government does, you can't. I don't think people can consent to government in the first place. Uh, so it, I should probably ask how you get from here to there. That might be, it's a longer question, a longer answer. Yeah, well, I'll try to get quick here. I've been talking a lot, but I'll, I'll say two things. One, if you want to hear my views on consent, uh, go to TomWBell.com. It's very easy to find if you remember my name. And look under writings and look to the paper called Graduated Consent Theory. So basically, I have a theory of consent that says consent obtains by degrees. And this I wrote in response basically to Lysander Spooner. Lysander Spooner's view is, I didn't expressly consent to this like I went to a contract, so the hell with that. And I understand that, and I respect it, and I admire it in a lot of ways. He's a cranky old guy, and he's saying, no, and he's stomping his foot. But I realize that's not the world I live in. I live in a world where I use the post office, and I drive on the public highway, and I see the United States as better than some competing governments. I'm staying here. There are some indications of my consent, but they're weak. And so I see consent on this sliding scale. And my goal is to describe the scale of consent, to posit, as Lysander Spooner did, the ideal as expressed consent but to recognize there are lesser forms of consent which are also at least probative, if not you know, proof of consent. They tell us something about how binding a relationship is with the government. So they, that's one thing. And the other thing was... Um, Getting there. What's that? Getting there. Yeah, basically, I, I'm trying a number of things, but you know, speaking in front of groups like this and telling them, let's take, basically, I'm working on the Constitution interpretation side. If I can convince libertarians, hey guys, there's a theory of interpretation that suits your political views, which is not originalism, you know, shake off the originalists. They got half of it right, but only half of it. It's like libertarians who hang out with right wingers. They say, well, you yeah, know, they're good on the economic stuff. Oh, little man. <laughs> and there's a better crowd. And I'm saying, I want to get people to start looking at this constitution like a contract. And that will encourage them to adopt more pro freedom interpretations. It's a long time project, but, you know, maybe 30, 40 years, maybe you'll have somebody in front of the Supreme Court saying, that's not what I read, Your Honor. Well, we have precedents that's contradictory to the plain text. And we all understand how the plain text controls. And that'd be a better world, and it'd be that, that much closer to where we want to be. Mm -hmm. uh, two quick questions. Uh, do you have any comment on the zeitgeist movement that's trying to get communities just like this? And what do we do with the San Diego judges who use rape, sodomy, and shit piss and vomit cells to coerce guilty pleas? Wow. I know you have a little different opinion of judges, but the functionally illiterate, <laughs> abusive, torture judges in San Diego where you can't get access to 1983 litigation? Well, I don't know about the Zeitgeist Movement. Uh, if they're trying to teach people about the importance of liberty, that sounds good to me. Uh, and as to the abuses uh, that you're alleging in San Diego, I, I haven't heard about them. I can't comment on one particular. I will say, from what I've heard about the prison system, it is 
cruel and unusual punishment, I think uh, even judges have agreed. In fact, in California, the state prisons are now under federal control because the federal judges said the way you're packing them in constitutes cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, but I don't know what's happening in San Diego. It sounds bad, and I don't doubt it is. Prisons in California have been found to be cruel and unusual. So that's about all I can say with what very limited knowledge I have about that. Well, the question is, what do we do with the judges who use that uh, violence and that degradation to coerce guilty pleas of innocent homeowners, etc.? Yeah, I, uh, what do we do with them? It's very hard to do anything with them. They're not elected judges. Are they municipal judges? Or? Some are. Some, Some are. well, if they're elected, you know what to do there. Although that's not an easy thing to do to get rid of an elected judge. And you're right, probably 1983 actions will tell you nothing, but well, that, my friend, is a hard problem. It's a hard nut to crack, and I wish I had some sort of in the trenches, here's what you do advice, but I'm kind of more of an egghead. And I, you know, I just, I, you don't want to turn to me for practical advice. <laughs> <laughs> I have my, my skills and my strengths, but that's not it. <laughs> so good luck, but uh, get somebody who knows what they're doing. Any other questions? Yes? I mean, this Constitution has been basically Abolished, or not even, I mean, extraordinary rendition is certainly cruel and unusual punishment. Waterboarding, waterboarding, and cruel and, and extraordinary rendition. And George Bush said the Constitution is just a piece of paper. That yeah. seems to be the way we're going. Gun laws. Uh, it seems like they've kind of taken the Constitution and trashed it already. If we move towards less statism, wouldn't the Constitution go out the window as well? Uh, well, I don't, I, I, you can't be certain. If, if you've read um, uh, Taleb Nisan's, or is it Nisan Taleb's book, uh, Black on Black, what is it? Black Swan. The Black Swan, yeah. I mean, I don't want to discount the possibility that something incredibly uh, uh, violent and perhaps wonderful, but still scary could happen to the US government. But basically, my assumption is it's going to be around for a long time. And uh, I can always recommend reading uh, Gibbons' Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, especially late at night. And that will, uh, <laughs> well, it'll save you to sleep, but you'll have pretty freaky dreams. You wake up in the morning thinking, okay, that's where we are. Uh, so we're right about the time of Commodus, I think, <laughs> which is a scary thought. So at any rate, I don't think the United States government is going to go away anytime soon. And so my goal is to stick with these institutions that exist and try to, I'm an ameliorist, try to improve things at the margin. I'm about revolution at the margin. <laughs> and the mark. I, I know we can get somewhere much better, but right now all I can say is let's go a little closer to freedom and then a little closer and just it's like the fadings of socialism, but on the side of good and truth instead of greater statism. But right now they're trashing the constitution. Well, there are people who are fighting for the constitution too. But my way of fighting for it is to tell people that these words mean something. Let's take them seriously. And there's other people with other fights and other techniques and I wish them well. That's just, I think, the best way for me to approach this, and you know, well, wish me luck, because if I'm right, we'll end up better off, and if I'm wrong, I'll just be another academic who's ignored, and that's fine. I'll have a tenure anyhow. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I better stop with your question, sir. Okay. Uh, what I, what I, first of all, I think the strength of, the, of this country is the individuals, because the the people are, um, they they will. They, were, they are not willing to be suppressed. That's why this is here. And if you look at, as major corporations have failed, all those people become entrepreneurs and start their own businesses so it keeps alive. That we are willing to do what it takes to make our life work. But what we have to do is understand who we're voting for, not what they're saying. And we have to be willing to have someone who has business background rather than a bunch of lawyers. Because they will find more ways to twist the words to their avail that put us at a disadvantage. And once they understand that people know and people care, we can invoke the change. But we have to do it from the people. This is our country, not theirs. I can't, I, I can't add to that. I think that's a great statement. I, I don't dispute that you can't always trust attorneys, although as the illusion example demonstrates, you often want to have them on your side, They're kind of like gunslingers, I guess. Right. But you wouldn't hire a gunslinger to watch your kids, would you? I don't think. I'm afraid he's going to shoot. Yeah, especially my kids. Uh, all right, I'll stop there. Thank you for your time.